Um, so I'm uh, very happy to be here again at the uh, Bodhi Day talk. Um, I really thank you for this opportunity. And I'm always happy to see my friends in the American Sangha. And I hope that uh, now that COVID is less of a threat and life is starting to return to normal, I can see many of you in person again, either in the United States or Japan. Um, today, I'd like to talk about a practical topic that I hope will contribute to uh, enriching your daily practice and deepening your experience of the Lotus Sutra. As you can tell by the title of the talk, I'm going to speak about the Dharanis of the Lotus Sutra. Visho Kosekai has shared many elements of the practice of the Lotus Sutra with people around the world. In RK centers throughout the world, you can see Bangladeshis, Sri Lankans, Indians, Taiwanese, Americans, Brazilians, British people, uh, Italians, and many other people uh, participating in and even leading Dharma circle discussions, reciting the text of the Lotus Sutra, studying its teachings in depth, applying its principles, especially revering people's Buddha nature, and also uh, teachings like uh, cherishing one's encounters. But one noticeable absence from the practice of many people outside of Japan is the recitation of the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis. I first noticed this uh, at IBC, the International Buddhist Congregation, which is a group established in Tokyo for foreign residents uh, in Japan to practice Buddhism in their native languages. Japanese participants in IBC can chant the Dharanis of the Lotus Sutra very well, but for the most part, the non-Japanese members of IBC cannot recite the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis. Over time, I learned that this was often true at RK's uh, overseas Dharma centers as well. Very often, Japanese expats who practice at RK overseas Dharma centers can chant the Dharanis very well, but it is rare that members who are originally from those countries can chant the Dharanis well. So I asked myself, why is this? Why is this so? It is indeed difficult to learn how to chant the Dharanis well, but they are just as difficult to learn for Japanese as it, is, as it is for Americans or Brazilians or Italians and so forth. So why is it that Japanese practitioners are so much better at chanting the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis? And why is it that chanting the Dharanis is rarely an important part of the regular practice of non-Japanese practitioners? I think that one big reason for this is that people who have grown up in Western countries, and in particular, uh, the Dharanis for them feel somewhat unfamiliar or alien, and it is hard for people to reconcile the Dharanis with the rest of the Lotus Sutra. Nisho Kosekai founder Niwano often said that the Lotus Sutra is not difficult to understand, and he described it as a rational teaching compatible with modern ways of thinking. Yet inside this rational religious scripture are the Dharanis, which seem to be things that are not rational. They aren't translated, so nobody understands what they mean. And since they aren't teachings, they don't seem to say anything to us. The claim that reciting the Dharanis can protect Lotus Sutra practitioners also sounds to people like magic. For these reasons, the Dharanis may seem irrational to people who have grown up in a materialist technological culture where people put their faith in science and technology and where things that are not understandable in rational and scientific ways are generally rejected. From such a worldview, the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis seem non-rational and may strike people as out of place, as if they don't even belong in the Lotus Sutra. People may feel that the Dharanis are an aspect of the Lotus Sutra that is incompatible with the contemporary world and contrary to a religious faith that is rational and modern. I suspect people skip over the Dharanis and avoid them choosing to concentrate on other aspects of Lotus Sutra practice that they feel uh, are compatible with modernity and effective in leading people toward liberation from suffering. I have also seen Japanese practitioners trying to explain the importance of the Dharanis to non-Japanese practitioners rather unsuccessfully. The fact that the Dharanis are part of the tradition of the Lotus Sutra is simply not a convincing explanation to people whose worldview largely rejects appeals to tradition for legitimacy. Contemporary Western culture is a culture of questioning tradition 
And tradition does not automatically equal legitimacy. I think that in sharing Buddhism, we need to respect the worldviews, cultures, and natural spiritual sensibilities of the various peoples around the world. However, I also feel that we should not be so quick to abandon a tradition that has survived for thousands of years. If something has been around for so long, we can expect that there are valid reasons for its survival. For example, modern science has often discovered that traditional folk remedies for sickness and health do indeed have beneficial effects, and many traditional remedies and practices are increasingly being adopted again in the 21st century. Now, the ancient traditions or the ancient explanations for traditional practices may not always hold up to scientific inquiry, but there may still be benefits from those practices, whether they are physical, psychological, emotional, or spiritual. In the same way, if people today are going to become more familiar with the Lotus Sutras Dharanis and learn how to practice them, they will have to think about their Dharanis and make sense of them in ways that fit their own culture, their own worldview, and their own sense of spirituality. So, what's in a Dharani? I hope I can make the Dharanis feel less alien to you, make them more interesting for you, and help you discover some benefits to reciting the Dharanis, and provide uh, some perspectives for making sense of the Dharanis and incorporating them into your practice from the standpoint of your own spirituality. Before we proceed, I would like to give you an outline of what I will share with you today. First, I will discuss the meaning of the term Duran Dharani and how it has been interpreted. Second, I will share with you a story about one of the characters that teaches a Dharani in chapter 26 of the Lotus Sutra. I hope you will get to know this character so you will have a context for the Dharani and understand how that character symbolically embodies the teachings. And hopefully this will allow you to feel more familiar with the Dharanis. And third, I will discuss the difficult issue of the original meaning of the Dharanis. And I will take a look at two of the Dharanis that are introduced in chapter 26 of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, fourth, I will discuss reciting the Dharanis from the standpoint of being a type of meditation, specifically sound immersion meditation. I hope exploring these issues will help you find value in reciting the Dharanis and allow you to integrate them into your daily practice from the perspective, uh, from a perspective that's fitting for you. So let's discover what's in a Dharani. As most of you already know, the 26th chapter of Kumarajiva's translation of the Lotus Sutra is called Dharani. In this chapter, the Bodhisattva Medicine King, Bodhisattva Courageous Donor, the Heavenly King Vaishravana, the Heavenly King Sustainer of the Domain, and the Mother of Demons, along with the 10 Rakshasha Demons, teach people Dharanis. As Medicine King describes in the chapter, the Dharanis are given to guard and protect Dharma teachers. Also, in chapter 28, the Bodhisattva Universal Sage teaches the Assembly of Dharani to protect Dharma teachers and further the dissemination of the Lotus Sutra. Dharanis are chanted incantations. Sometimes they were called spells. In ancient Buddhism, they were chanted for various reasons. These include practical benefits such as protection and well-being, healing, and the successful dissemination of the teaching. Dharanis were also associated with the development of specific powers, such as a photographic memory. And Dharanis were also thought to encode the truth of the Buddha's teachings, which could then be realized by continually reciting the Dharanis. So Dharani, as you probably know, is a Sanskrit word. So let's think about what it means. So it seems that Dharanis were first used as a method of concentrating the mind or entering samadhi. But because the concentrated mind could remember things well, reciting Dharanis came to be associated with attaining the ability to remember the sutras. Later, because of the association of samadhi and the development of wisdom, as well as the association of samadhi and the development of transcendent powers, the Dharanis also seem to have become associated with both attaining wisdom and then transcendent powers. The root of the word Dharani is jur, which means to uphold or to maintain. In the sense of maintaining, a Dharani can mean to hold something in memory. 
So it said that uh, those who had Durrani's could uh, uphold all the teachings in their mind. The, sometimes the word was translated into Chinese to mean upholding everything. For this reason, in the past, many monks practiced uh, Durrani's so you could so they could gain the power to remember all the teachings of the Dharma that they had studied. If you know the story of the Japanese monk Nichiren's life, you know that when he was young, um, he propitiated the Bodhisattva Akashagarbha. And it's he seems that he may have practiced uh, the Bodhisattva, that Bodhisattva's Dharanis. Now, this is sometimes translated, the Bodhisattva is called the Space Treasury Bodhisattva. So Nichiren uh, pursued this practice uh, while vowing to become the wisest person in Japan. Dharanis were also said to protect Dharma teachers in at least three ways. First, by healing disease. Second, by lessening or mitigating the Dharma teacher's karma. And third, by preventing the occurrence of disasters and misfortunes. In the Lotus Sutra, we also see that Dharanis are associated with specific abilities, such as the Dharani of understanding the words of all living beings. Founder Niwano of Bicho Kosekai de described this Durrani as a metaphor for the Bodhisattva's power to perceive the true wishes that are behind the words of all living beings. So this brings us to the issue of the symbolic interpretation of the word Durrani. In Buddhism, there are many ways to interpret something, and two main types of interpretation are, number one, a literal interpretation, and two, a symbolic or allegorical interpretation. Now, Buddhism has always used these two approaches together, and it didn't reject one for the other. For example, you may know that uh, a bodhisattva, like the regarder of the sounds of the world, is described in Buddhist texts as a person, but is also at the same time seen as a symbol of the compassion of the Buddha. As you may know, founder Niuno emphasized the importance of understanding this symbolic interpretation when reading the Lotus Sutra. There is also a symbolic interpretation of Durrani. This symbolic interpretation is the basic explanation of the meaning of the word Durrani in Founder Niwano's writings. In his many commentaries on the Lotus Sutra, Founder Niwano's basic explanation of Durrani is that it symbolically means the ability to impede everything that is evil and advance everything that is good. This is the most basic understanding of the meaning of the word Durrani in the Lotus Sutra tradition. So symbolically, a practitioner whose practice is very deep and who can prevent unskillful things in their life and instead advance skillful attitudes and behaviors is said to possess Dharanis. In addition to the symbolic interpretation of Dharani, founder Niwano also has a somewhat mystical uh, description of Dharanis as well. He says um, that in reciting the Dharanis taught in chapter 26, as well as 28 of the Lotus Sutra, um, you can uh, attain a sense of peace and tranquility that allows you to feel closer to the Buddhas. And in, in literally his language is that you get this sense of directly entering the realm of the Buddhas. I think we might uh, be able to feel more comfortable with the Dharanis if we knew about the characters who teach the Dharanis. This is one way I think we can feel more comfortable with the Dharanis and get to know them better. So if we get to know the people who teach the Dharanis in the Sutra and understand their background stories, by associating stories with Dharanis, we can better appreciate them. There are several beings who teach Dharanis in the Lotus Sutra. Three are bodhisattvas with whom you are probably already familiar. You can learn about those bodhisattvas by reading and studying the sutra. There are also two Indian deities, the heavenly king Vaishravana and the heavenly king sustainer of the domain, who were said to guard the world in the northern and eastern directions, respectively. However, you may not know much about the mother of demons and the ten Rakshasha demons, who are also who also teach Adrani in chapter 26. Rakshasa demons are forest-dwelling spirits that were said to eat human flesh. The Lotus Sutra never really explains who these demons are, and nor does it introduce the mother of demons. She just seems to appear out of nowhere in the sutra, and then she teaches Adrani. 
Since we don't understand who she is, it may be difficult to understand her significance and her relationship to the Lotus Sutra teaching, and this makes it more difficult to appreciate her Dharani. The Sutra doesn't tell us much about Mother of Demons because a person in India 2,000 years ago would have been very familiar with the Mother of Demons. Everyone knew about her. She was well known as a fertility goddess who helped women conceive, have safe pregnancies, and she also was said to protect their children. For this reason, the Lotus Sutra didn't have to introduce her at all. However, people in the United States or Europe usually have no idea who she is. So today I will tell you a little bit about the mother of demons. The mother of demons is also known by her actual name, Hariti. There are many versions of her story in Buddhist texts throughout Asia. One version says she was a childless woman in the city of royal palaces, Rajagurha. And this is where the Buddha often taught the Dharma, as you probably know. So it was said that uh, Hariti wanted to have a child so badly that she kidnapped the children of others. Many versions of the story, and particularly the one that seems to be the background of the Mother of Demons in the Lotus Sutra, say that Hariti was a Rakshasa demon who lived in the area of the city of royal palaces. She was the consort of Panchinka, a fearful, uh, fearsome deity, uh, excuse me, uh, leader of the Rakshasa demons, and you can see him on the slide. So Hariti was the consort of Panchika, and together they had uh, many children. According to some stories of versions of the story, it was 500 children, others say 1,000. Since all of her children were demons of one type or another, Hariti became known as the mother of demons. And despite having so many children of her own, Hariti would kidnap and eat the children of the city of royal palaces. So according to the Mother of Demons Sutra, a copy of which you can see on the slide, one day when the Buddha's attendant Ananda and other monks were going to the town to beg for alms, all that they saw that all the townspeople were upset and crying. Now, after finishing their begging and returning to where they had been staying, Ananda and the monks couldn't help but talk amongst themselves about how sad they felt for the families that had lost children. Shakyamuni Buddha overheard them talking and asked them uh, what their conversation was about. The monks explained the situation to Shakyamuni Buddha. The Buddha responded to them, in this country, there is someone who steals children, but it is no ordinary person. She was born into this world as a mother of demons. She delights in stealing the people's children, even though she already has a thousand or 500 children of her own. Now, 500 of those children are said to live in the world, and another 500 are said to live in the heavens. Each of them is a demon king in command of several tens of thousands of other demons. So as Hariti was no ordinary person, but instead a dangerous Rakshasa demon, to deal with Hariti, the Buddha used an approach called inverse transformation. Sometimes people call it reverse or inverse liberation, gakke in Japanese. Instead of taking the normal, overtly compassionate approach that you would expect from a, someone like the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha used a kind of tough love. He used this tough love on Hariti to change her heart and show her that her actions were wrong. In the version of the story from the Mother of Demons Sutra, the Buddha instructed his monks to wait until Hariti wasn't home and then to sneak into her house and kidnap all of her children and then whisk the children off to the monastery before Hariti returns. In the version of the story in another Chinese Buddhist text, the Buddha went by Hariti's house while he was out begging and discovering that Hariti was not home, the Buddha himself snuck into the house and kidnapped Hariti's youngest and favorite child, Pingala. The Buddha used his transcendent powers to make himself and the young Pingala invisible so that Pingala's older siblings didn't see the Buddha sneak into the house and kidnap Pingala. The Buddha is also said to have used his transcendent powers to hide Pingala in his begging bowl. 
Now, when Hariti returned, she discovered her beloved Pingala missing, and she asked his siblings what had happened to him. The siblings all answered that they didn't know. Frantic, Hariti searched all throughout the world for him, from the top of the highest mountains that reach into the heavens down to the deepest hells, all to no avail. She even asked many gods about the whereabouts of her child, but they didn't know either, until she asked the god Vaishravana. Vaishravana told Hariti that if she went to the Buddha, the Buddha could help her. So Hariti went to see Shakyamuni Buddha, fell at his feet, and begged the Buddha to, out of his boundless compassion, allow her to see her son again. Shakyamuni Buddha asked Hariti, how many children do you have? Hariti answered him, I have 500 children. The Buddha replied, and even though you have 500 children, do you suffer so much for the loss of just one of them? Hariti answered the Buddha, if I don't see my child again this very day, I will certainly become ill with fever, vomit blood, and die. Changing his tone, the Buddha responded, if you are suffering like this from not being able to see even one of your 500 children, how much more is the suffering of the parents of an only child whom you've kidnapped and eaten? At that moment, Hariti realized for the first time the immense suffering she had caused other people. Their suffering must be many more times than my suffering, she admitted to the Buddha. Shakyamuni pressed her again. If you indeed know what, it, know what it is to feel the suffering of having to part with a loved one, how can you continue to eat the sons and daughters of other people? Hariti then expressed remorse for her actions and implored the Buddha, World honored one, I have but one request. Show me what I can do to repent. Shakyamuni Buddha answered, You should receive the precepts. Hariti took refuge in the three treasures, pledging to depend upon the Buddha, his teachings, and the help of the community of the Buddha's disciples. And she also received the five precepts from Shakyamuni Buddha. The first of these, as you probably know, is the most important to refrain from killing. After Hariti received the precepts, Shakyamuni Buddha used his transcendent powers to make Pingala, who had been hidden inside his begging bowl, to reappear, and Hariti was reunited with her beloved son. Out of gratitude to Shakyamuni Buddha, Hariti asked to reside at the monastery to be close to the Buddha, and she ple pledged to protect the monastery. Shakyamuni Buddha then promised that, uh, Hariti that his monks would always donate a portion of their meals to feed her and her children so that they, would, uh, that, so that they could give up eating the flesh of human beings. The Buddha also told Hariti to use her powers to help childless women who had come to the monastery to pray for a child, to ensure that they had safe pregnancies, and also to protect their children. Hariti agreed to follow the Buddha's instructions. Hariti's story is rich with meaning, but let's think about it from the standpoint of what we can apply to our own lives and practice. Now, Hariti was like most of us. We, too, rarely seek out the Buddha or the Buddhist teachings until suffering touches us. Most of us first enter the uh, path of practice because we are concerned about our own suffering or we're unhappy with our lives or unhappy with ourselves in some way. Our first reason for practice is concern for ourselves. Some people might feel that Shakyamuni Buddha's tough love was a bit harsh, but by hiding Hariti's child, the Buddha made Hariti feel the same feelings that the parents of her victims felt. What the Buddha did was use Hariti's own feelings of suffering as a skillful means to get her to understand the feelings of others. Hariti became able for the first time to feel what other people felt when she took their children. The Buddha led Hariti to expand her compassion for herself and for her own children to include other people. Then, this compassion for other people caused her to reflect upon her own behavior and vow to correct it. 
the expansion of her compassion allowed her to be able to do repentance, which the new version of the new translation of the Lotus Sutra translates as acknowledgement and remorse. Hariti acknowledged her wrongs and expressed remorse for them. Now, as you know, repentance or acknowledgement and remorse is not really true contrition unless it is expressed in action. When we express acknowledgement and remorse in action, we shift from practicing the noble truth of the cause and we directly enter the practice of the noble truth of the path. We do the practices that bring liberation from suffering and lead to awakening. One Nisho Kosei Kai Reverend in the United States says that acknowledgement and remorse is to reflect and correct. Hariti corrected her behavior by protecting children rather than kidnapping and eating them. Now, as a practitioner, Hariti's primary vow is to protect people's children. As a protector of children, Hariti was, became famous throughout India and Central Asia, and eventually she became known in East Asia as well. Many Buddhist temples had still today have prayer ceremonies to ask Hariti to protect children and also to protect pregnant women and ensure a safe and easy pregnancy and delivery. This is a tradition that continues, as I said, to this very day. So in the Lotus Sutra, when Hariti gives a Dharani and promises to protect dormant teachers, the listeners and readers of the Lotus Sutra in the past were already very familiar with her and she needed no introduction. So I think there's a deeper meaning to the story of Hariti, the mother of demons. She transforms from a person who kills children into a person who protects children. Now, we might find this strange as protecting children is the exact opposite of killing children. We might think that someone who kills children is totally different from someone who protects children. From the standpoint of our normal everyday thinking, we may not be able to understand her transformation. Yet, the Lotus Switcher tells us that all possible states of mind are present in all of us. Within the mind of a person who is filled with anger and wants to kill or harm others, there is also the mind of the Bodhisattva and the mind of the Buddha. Aditi's story also shows us that there can be good intentions or Bodhisattva motivations behind even bad behaviors. Aditi loved her own children, but she ate the children of others. These two actions are not unconnected. Her great love for her own children was so overwhelmingly strong that she hated the children of others. And in order to feed her own children and keep them alive, she fed them the flesh of other children. Now, I think if you think about it, you may realize that we too are also like this, or we can be like that. For example, we might love our own people in our own country so strongly that we see people from other cultures and countries as a threat. We might want to protect our own people, so we see other people as dangerous. A person can love their own people and at the same time hate others. And the two emotions can be connected, like they are the two sides of the same coin. Now, Hariti could not see other children as equal to her own children. Hariti could not see the equality of things, and she could not see the equality of living beings. But the Buddha, by making Hariti see that she felt the same pain as other parents, made her realize that she was just like those other parents and that their children were just like her own children. By seeing things equally, Hariti became able to expand her love for her own children to the children of others she became able to love universally. Now, by loving universally, no one was outside her love. In the same way, if, a let's say, a nationalist who loves their own people can learn to see other people as equals, they can extend their love to other people and love more universally. The Lotus Sutra transforms people by finding the good Bodhisattva motivations behind bad behavior 
leading people to realize their inner bodhisattva motivations and to correct their desires or correct how their desires are expressed in their behavior. So this is kind of similar or resonates with the Sutra of Innumerable Meanings, the first part of the Threefold Lotus Sutra, when the Sutra says, this Sutra can make one who lacks kindness aspire to compassion, make one who likes slaughter uh, aspire to great mercy, make one who is envious rejoice to others, make one who has attachments aspire to non-attachment. And I think you can see that all of these emotions are paired and they're basically 180 degrees opposite of each other. It's because they're, they're operating on the same fulcrum. They're not, they're not actually separate. They're the, the flip sides of the same coin. The story of Hariti expresses the principles and teachings of the Lotus Sutra very well. It's no coincidence that she appears in the Lotus Sutra to teach Udurani. Hariti embodies the principle that delusion is inseparable from awakening. There can be no awakening without struggling with delusion. Hariti's story also gives us hope that, as is often said in, in American and European culture, the greater the sinner, the greater the saint. When you recite the Dharanis of chapter 26, I, I hope the story of Hariti can be on your mind and you remember what her story teaches us. Now here you can see there's a, as a Japanese statue of Hariti. Notice that she has a baby inside her kimono. She's protecting the child by placing it inside the fold of her kimono and keeping it warm and dry and allowing it to suckle. This is sort of the classic depiction of Hariti in especially East Asia. The Dharanis in the version of the Lotus Sutra that we all have, are not translated. Kumarajiva, who translated the Lotus Sutra into Chinese in around the year 406, left the Dharanis untranslated. Dharanis were one of the five kinds of untranslated words and phrases that translators often did not translate. Translators refused to translate words and phrases of the sutras into Chinese for several reasons. One reason was that there was no equivalent word concept or thing in Chinese. Another reason was that in some cases, the word or phrase had many nuances and meanings and translation couldn't capture all of them. Also, some words and phrases like those of the Dharanis were thought to be weakened and lose their power if translated. In ancient Indian culture and religion, it was believed that language or sound was, was created by the god Brahma. So the 42 basic sounds or letters in the Sanskrit language were considered to be sacred. And it was thought that they had the power to affect reality. In fact, it was believed that the word, um, that the world was created out of sound. Thus for a Dharani to be effective and work properly, it had to be recited correctly. The Buddhist translators also believed in the power of words and that for the Dharanis to work, they had to be chanted properly. For this reason, any translations of the Dharanis into another language would not have the same power as when chanted in their original language with the original pronunciation. So it was the sounds and the precise combination of sounds that was thought to be the most important. Therefore, instead of translating the Dharanis, Kumarajiva wrote them down using characters whose sounds were similar to the original sounds, the original pronunciations of the Dharanis. This way, ancient Chinese people could recite the Dharanis uh, with a sound close to the original sound. Now, because of this, if you try to understand the Dharanis based on the meaning of the Chinese characters that are used, it, it makes no sense. They're assigned only for, for sound. And that's uh, something called sound or, or, or transliteration. But for contemporary people, people today, uh, the sounds of words for the most part don't have magical power. Instead, people today think the power of a word lies in its meaning. If the importance of a word lies in its meaning, then a Durrani that's untranslated usually has no significance for people. For this reason, in contrast to ancient Buddhists, many practitioners today feel the need to know the meanings of the Durrani's before they recite them. 
if they can't confirm the meanings of what they're reciting, many people don't see why they should recite it. Now, there are several reasons for there are several reasons why reconstructing the original meaning of the Lotus Sutras Dharanis is difficult, and scholars don't always agree on the original meanings of the Dharanis. Now, we are lucky that the monk Dharma Raksha, who translated an earlier Chinese version of the Lotus Sutra in 286, broke with the tradition, and Dharma Raksha actually translated the Lotus Sutras Dharanis. So this gives us an early understanding, or at least his understanding, of what the Dharanis meant. There are also Tibetan translations of the Dharanis, but in some cases, the Tibetan translators differed with Dharma Raksha, and the translations are different. Not all, but, but some of them in significant places. In Founder Niwano's 10-volume commentary on the Lotus Sutra, there is a list of translations for each of the words and phrases that appear in the Dharanis. As Founder Niwano explains, his translations for the separate words and phrases of the Dharanis is mostly derived or greatly derived from the Buddhist scholar Sukhamoto Kesho's work. Now, many sections of the Dharanis can also be interpreted in multiple ways. Uh, so in some cases, Founder Niwano includes several possible interpretations for the words and phrases of the Dharanis. In a nutshell, recovering the original meanings of the Lotus Sutras Dharanis is difficult and probably not possible with total certainty. The founder Niwano and Japanese scholar Kamata Shigio agreed on the meaning of the Dharani of the Bodhisattva Medicine King. And their reading roughly corresponds to Tsukamoto. So I'll show you their interpretation, and that's on the left side of the screen. The English is on top and the Japanese is on bottom. Now, on the right side of the screen, your screen is another author's interpretation. So if you look at them, you can see some similarities. But I think you can, if you compare the two, um, the two translations or two interpretations, you will also get a sense that, that the exact meaning is difficult to recover because you can see differences in the two interpretations. Now, also, um, since the phrases in the Dharani appear to have been conjugated in Sanskrit as if they were addressed to a female, now this conjugation is called the feminine singular vocative, when you address a person, um, but this is addressing a, a, a female character. Um, because of this, uh, the scholar Tsukamoto adds phrases to all of these sentences such as she who or oh she who is. Um, so his interpretation would be a little bit different as if the Dharanis are addressing or speaking to a female. So in the case of the Dharani given by the 10 Rakshashas in Hariti, the mother of demons, there is also some disagreement. One theory of a few scholars is that many of the phrases in the Dharani are invoking the names of female spirits, local sort of deities in India. The Tibetan translation, although based on a later version of the text in Kumarajivas, seems to confirm this, this suspicion that some scholars have. However, Dharmaraksha's translation, his, his translation uh, in 286 CE into Chinese, um, as well as Tsukamoto and Founder Niwano's interpretation also rough, but they roughly agree on at least one important part of the Dharani that I think might be significant to you. Dharmaraksha's translation of the middle portion of the Dharani, which corresponds to the passage Debi 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 in the Kyoten, is as follows. Dharmaraksha, who I just told you, if you remember it, he actually translated the Dharanis into Chinese. He translates the section of the Dharani as meaning without self, without I, without body, without attainment, but possessing oneness. Founder Niwano's interpretation is roughly similar. It's a repetition of no ego mind, no ego mind, no ego mind, no ego mind, no ego mind. You could also interpret it as a repetition of non-self, 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 non-self. 
And here again, if we followed Tsukamoto's assertion that the phrases in the Dranis are addressed to a, a, a female character, um, then uh, we could translate this passage as saying, she who is beyond the ego mind, she who is beyond the ego mind, she who is beyond the ego mind, etc. So what I would like to point out here is the emphasis on the notion of non-self. One of the three most important teachings of Buddhism called the three seals of the Dharma. You know, like the, the main one is not, well, not the main, but um, non-self is the sort of this root teaching in Buddhism. So this is repeated over and over again in this passage of, the, of uh, Hariti's Dharani. Now, non-self doesn't mean you don't exist. This is a common misunderstanding because of the, because of the word. Um, and it doesn't mean you don't have an identity. Non-self, it's a Buddha translation from the Sanskrit. Um, it means that you don't have an eternal, unchanging, independent existence or identity. And what it's saying is that the word really says, or the concept says that we are all interconnected and we mutually encompass one another. We're interconnected. So none of us has a totally separate self. Nobody has a totally separate I. Our bodies are sustained by all things around us in the universe. So we are not separate from all other things. And in this sense, we are without an independent body. And if we are interconnected in part of all things, uh, all things are also part of us. There is nothing to be obtained. There is nothing that we can grab a hold of, and so we make our own possession. And if we are all interdependent with one another, we are one with all things. Now, in the story of Hariti that I just discussed, she realized that she was not a separate self. She, was, she realized that she was not an independent ego from others. And she came to understand that she was the same as others and one with them. She realized the truth of interdependence and interconnectedness with other people. In other words, she realized the truth of non-self in a way like her Durrani expresses it. Seeing the equality of things, the oneness of self and other, is exactly how Hariti, the mother of demons, expanded her notion of love uh, from love for herself and her own children to include the children of others and to become a universal love. So her Durrani's, Hariti's, you know, the mother of demons that Durrani's repetition of non-self, 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 you know, it, it, it makes sense. It, it resonates with the teachings that she's, she embodies, the teachings that she symbolizes. So for us to obtain a universal love of living beings, we too must realize non-self, just like Aditi realized it. As Tsukamokuta translates, we can say that she went beyond the ego mind. Now, if we stop seeing each other as totally separate things, um, and we stop seeing other people that are outside of us and stand against us, then we also will no longer take things that happen to us as personal attacks. And we might feel pain in life, but we won't suffer in the sense that we won't take what happens to us personally. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time today to explore the meanings of all of the Lotus Sutras Dharanis. And as I I've sort of touched on, admittedly, the discovery of the exact original meanings is difficult. However, I think that we can see a connection between the meaning of the mother of demons and the Rakshasha's Dharani and the story of Hariti, the mother of demons. So I hope this gives you a sense that the Dharanis, even if they are not sounds that we can understand as language, they weren't, they weren't meaningless gibberish. Um, so I hope that that's, that's something that you've seen, that they did have meaning and purpose. Now, I'd like to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about the Dharanis for a while, but now, before we proceed any further, Let's experience and appreciate the Dharanis. I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Chris Ladisaw and the leaders of the Oklahoma Dharma Center for chanting the Dharanis for us. 
Now, in the interest of time, they will be deviating a little bit from the northern, normal pattern of chanting the Dharanis. They'll chant the Dharanis only one time. And they'll also omit the text portion uh, of chapter 26 that follows the Dharanis. So please forgive uh, the change in ritual decorum in the interest of time. So please sit back, close your eyes, and listen to the drawings. say about after listening to the Dharanis is that I think even if we don't understand the Dharanis and even if they aren't teachings in the normal sense, I think it's a mistake to assume that chanting the Dharanis is without meaning or rationality. Meaning, I think, is not limited to semantic meaning. A ritual practice like reciting the Dharanis is also a way of experiencing the world and thinking with the entire mind body. Attitudes, mental attitudes, are not merely internal mental states. To think that attitudes are only states of mind and not states of the total mind body, I think is, is, is a, a type of dualism. This is something that those of you who understand the Lotus Sutra's 10 suchnesses, I think already know. Reverence, the feeling or emotion of reverence, to take an example, is not merely a mental state. Reverence is a state of mind-body in its totality, a state of being in the world. To think of reverence only as a teaching or a concept, I, I, again, I think it's to get stuck in mind-body dualism. Now, watching the leaders and listening to the leaders of the Oklahoma Dharma Center, Chantha Dharani's, I think we can intuitively feel that they are reverently being in the world. They are embodying reverence. I think just the sound, their movements, um, their facial expressions, they, they become one with reverence. And it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a kind of reverence. We get a feeling from them of a reverence for the entire world, the world around them, everyone around them. So I, I think there is meaning there. It's a kind of thinking with the body and with the breath, the totality of being. 
Like I said, that was really wonderful. Um, now, after experiencing the Dharanis and hearing their sound and hearing the beat, the rhythm, I'd like to reflect on what it means to immerse ourselves in the sound of the Dharanis. As you may know, it's common for our Risho Kosekai practitioners to recite the Dharanis for people who are ill, for people facing significant challenges like surgery. Um, it's also common to recite Dharanis before important events that people hope will succeed. In some cases, I've seen Dharanis are recited in merit transfers for those who have passed away. Um, the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis in, uh, are also chanted, as I've said, in many temples in Japan, specifically the Nichiren sect as a, a prayer for safety, well-being, and various types of success. So this can give us the impression that the Dharanis are practiced as a kind of magic. Now, as I said before, many people today are uncomfortable with practices that seem like magic, and they feel that such practices are incompatible with modernity. But could it be true that chanting the Dharanis can contribute to our well-being? Can the Dharanis actually help us impede the bad in our lives and advance the good in our lives? So I think the answer is yes. Now, while not panaceas in any sense, um, I think reciting the Dharanis in conjunction with practicing the Buddhist teaching and implying them, uh, applying the teachings in our lives, uh, we can uh, gain many benefits. So in this section, I'd like to consider the benefits of reciting the Dharanis from the standpoint of the Dharanis as a type of sound immersion meditation. I think this is a perspective from which many people today can feel comfortable with the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis and integrate them into their daily practice. And there are many types of meditation. These days, meditation is very, very popular, but there are many types. The famous scholar of Taoism, Livia Kohn, divides the forms of meditation that we're used to into several different basic types. Now, she divides them into different types based on the way that the forms of meditation access the mind. Today, when we think of meditation, we often imagine Zen, Zen meditation, or uh, other times mindfulness meditation. But there are other types of meditation, including a broad category of meditation that um, Livia Cohn calls sound immersion. Now, according to Cohn, sound immersion is where practitioners use the steady repetition of a sound, a word, phrase, or longer sequence, such as a prayer or incantation, in conjunction with the breath to induce a state of calm and absorption. Like concentration, this method encourages deep breathing and conscious awareness and evokes the relaxation response. When continued over longer periods of time, it creates a state of deep unified oneness to the exclusion of all else. Sound immersion meditation stimulates the auditory system. It can bypass the analytical consciousness and allowing us to penetrate to the subconscious mind. And this can help us, Cohn says, weaken our bad habits and attitudes. It weakens the strength, the staying power of bad habits. Cohn says that the rhythm and the vibration of sound immersion meditation can also um, alter the frequencies of our brain waves. Many religious incantations, uh, mantras and dharanis, for example, but also certain types of prayers, can encourage the dominance of alpha waves in the brain, she explains. Alpha waves bring a sense of calmness and contentment, making feelings of anger and greed subside, and they can also reduce sleepiness and hunger. Now, I think we can all recognize that sound is clearly tied to healing and our physical and emotional health. Certain sounds like sirens, explosions, traffic, and so forth, leave us agitated, even fearful. Other sounds soothe us and give us reassurance, lessening our anxiety and bringing us peace. Our sound environment is closely related to our well-being. As I think you may have noticed when you listen to the leaders of the Oklahoma Dharma Center recite the Dharanis, the Lotus Sutra Dharanis, they sound beautiful and they can bring our hearts a sense of peace and tranquility. The ancient notion that certain sounds or combinations of sounds can have power is, I think it's not unfounded. 
A sound immersion meditation by chanting also controls and regulates the breath. In ancient Indian and Chinese cultures, the breath was considered the source of life. Meditations that controlled and manipulated the breath were thought to heal and even transform the physical body. In East Asian Buddhism, it is often said that the mind is controlled by regulating the posture and the breath, with the breath being especially important. Our pattern of breathing often reflects the state of our minds. I think if you concentrate on your breath, you'll notice this. With, uh, for example, hurried, rough, uneven breathing associated with anxiousness and an unsettled state of mind. Now, modern science is just beginning to take the art of breathing seriously and discovering that how we breathe has a great impact on our health. Most of us um, tend to breathe rather shallowly. We breathe with our chests. And because we breathe so shallowly with our chest instead of our solar plexus, our stomach, many of us then compensate by taking more breaths. So modern people, because of this, tend to underbreathe and overbreathe at the same time. Now, according to Cohn, we can further divide sound immersion meditation into two categories. The first category is the sound immersion that uses words or phrases that are understood by the people chanting them. The second category is meditating by using words or phrases that are not understood. So the Lotus Sutra's Dharanis fall into the second category. When chanters understand the words and phrases of an incantation, those words and phrases can be considered what Cohn calls affirmations, a form of suggestion that can imprint a certain mental attitude or idea on the mind. Uh, Cohn says there are a kind of way that we can reprogram our minds. Let me give you an example. There is one Nisho Kosekai reverend I've met who recites the Japanese word arigato, which means thank you. And he recites this over and over again, uh, again in his mind, and when he can, he recites it out loud. Consciously reciting thank you can attune the mind to a certain rhythmic pattern and bring calmness, but because this practice fills the consciousness with the theme of gratitude, the practice can also nurture an attitude of gratitude and appreciation toward the world. Now, when North American and European Bishokosekai members do sutra recitation in their own languages, we can think of that as a kind of affirmation style of sound immersion. By reciting the sutra in our own language, the teachings are inscribed onto our hearts and we can change our minds to be in accord with the teachings of the Buddha. Now, Dharanis are obviously different. Even if we learn the meaning of a Dharani, we don't really perceive a Dharani as understandable words when we chant it. This is one of the main reasons uh, I've said that why people may not be interested in chanting the Dharanis. People may feel that if they can't understand what they are chanting, that there is no meaning or purpose to chanting. However, I think this is a bit of a misunderstanding. And it's precisely when we don't understand what we chant that sound immersion can have great benefits. This is because sound immersion meditation with incantations that are not understandable can work especially well at calming our wayward, uncontrollable minds. As Cohn describes, sound immersion meditation can bypass the normal thinking mind. And this is, I think this is particularly true when we can't understand the meaning of what we are chanting. Our normal thinking and analytical mind pose a problem for us many times. Of course, we need to understand our world and we need to understand truth. But one of our biggest problems is that we can't control our thinking mind. Our thoughts run wild. We become obsessed with things and we can't shut off our minds. Random thoughts in our minds keep us awake at night and our thoughts lead to worrying and obsessions. And we, have, we can have anxiety because we can't stop our minds from thinking about negative things. We also can't stop our minds from thinking about the things we desire. And as I think you know, our, our behavior um, has its beginnings and its thoughts. If, you, if we can't control our minds, 
we won't be able to control our behavior. As many of you know, the Sutra for Contemplating Universal Sage, the third part of the Threefold Lotus Sutra, it's also called the Closing Sutra. Um, famously, the Sutra for Contemplating Universal Sage tells us that the mind is like a monkey that never stays still, even for a moment. So this sutra tells us also that we must subdue our minds. Now, the sutra is very serious here. The word subdue is shakubuku in Japanese, literally meaning to break and bend. Another sutra uh, says that subduing the mind is like when one lashes the mind to something that one does, so that one does not lose control over it. This is like attaching a chain to a monkey. Dharanis can work very well as a chain to subdue the thinking mind precisely because we can't understand them as language. When chanting Dharanis, our mind eventually gives up on trying to make sense of the sound, and this helps shut down the thinking mind. For this reason, the fact that we cannot understand the Dharanis as language when we hear them is actually very helpful. Also, the difficulty of chanting the Dharanis increases the power of our mindfulness and the mind's one-pointedness. When compared with the Odaimoka, for example, chanting the Dharanis requires a much greater degree of effort and concentration. While chanting the Dharanis can be difficult, the level of difficulty has a benefit. Furthermore, chanting Dharanis involves all our senses. So chanting them unites our consciousness and leaves no room for disruptive runaway thought. We use our physical bodies to produce the sound, and we have to concentrate very hard to properly pronounce the Dharanis. Huh? And we also hear the Dharanis as we chant them, and we feel their rhythm with our bodies. Our minds concentrate on both the sound and the act of making the sound. The rhythm and the sound of the Dharanis further helps calm the mind and the body through physiological mechanisms by tuning the mind to a specific rhythm and encouraging a serene state. The ordering of the breath that happens when we're chanting also calms the mind. For these reasons, we can consider chanting the Dharanis as a powerful form of calming meditation or samatha in Pali, shamatha in uh, Sanskrit. In Chinese and Japanese, this is called stopping, uh, literally je or chi or tomeru koto in uh, Japanese. In other words, this type of meditation is stopping the runaway mind that is like a monkey that never rests for a moment. Now, this has a purifying effect on the mind and weakens our negative habit energies. Calming meditation in Buddhism has several functions. First, it allows us to stop distracting thoughts and suppresses the strength of our mental defilement. When our minds are calm and focused, and we have suppressed the power of our you know, mental defilement or desires and negative attitudes, et cetera, et cetera, we don't, when we've done this, we don't do unskillful or bad or evil things as much as we did before, and thus we lessen our suffering. When we are doing fewer unskillful things and suffering less, we can behave more virtuously, and that's advancing the good. Second, calming meditation creates a state of mind in which we can contemplate the teachings of the Buddha very deeply, developing wisdom. Ultimately, it is the Buddha wisdom that brings liberation and that allows us to see the way things really are, or in the Lotus Sutra's language, the ultimate rea reality of all things, shoho jiso. Um, and that allows us to become Buddhist. Now, remember that a Dharani is said to mean the ability to impede everything that is evil and advance everything that is good. So I, I think we can rationally understand how Dharanis can help prevent bad things and encourage good things. I don't think we have to think of them as a type of magic. It's fine if you want to, but I think many people can't think of them that way. They can't accept them that way. 
Um, but by calming our minds and controlling our distracted thoughts and weakening the force of our delusions, we can prevent ourselves from doing the evil or unskillful things that lead to suffering. And instead, we can do more of the good or skillful things that lead to liberation from suffering and awakening. Having a Durrani, in other words, the ability to recite Duranis and attain a tranquil mind increases our ability to prevent the bad and encourage the good in our lives. Now, in the past, Duranis were said to perform healing. They were also said to lessen or mitigate karma and prevent disastrous and misfortune. I think we can affirm this view in several ways, not, not as magic, but from the perspective of a healthy way of living in both body and mind. First, the benefits of breathwork strongly suggest that Durrani practice can be part of a healthy lifestyle. Second, the power of sound immersion meditation to lessen the stubborn strength of our habit energies can be thought of as the function of Durrani's to lessen the force of our bad karma. And by being more mindful because of chanting a Durrani, we can avoid disasters in our lives by being more attentive to things and more aware of our surroundings. How many times have we ourselves caused disasters in our lives simply by being careless? By living in the moment and not being distracted, we can be safer in our daily lives. Now, founder Niwano also said that Durrani's can help us feel our oneness with the Buddhas. This explanation is obviously a little bit mystical, and people who are more interested in Buddhism as a science of the mind or a rational religion will be less open to this understanding of the Dharanis. But as Lydia Cohn explained, chanting the Dharanis often allows people to enter a peaceful state of mind in which they feel a sense of oneness with the world. Now we can speculate that through chanting the Dharanis and quieting the thinking analytical mind, we can begin to lose the sense of subject object distinction between ourselves and our environment, and that this could open up a capacity to see the world in a different way. However, instead of scientifically or rationally explaining the reasons for the feeling of oneness we might experience, oneness with the Buddhas and the world around us, I personally, I like to leave this unexplained. I like to leave it as a mystery. If practice teaches us something, brings us insights or some other benefit, I don't think we always have to have a logical explanation for it. Instead of explaining this feeling of oneness that the Dharanis can bring, I'd like to think of the feeling as a way of experiencing the truth of the Lotus Sutra in an embodied way with one's body and one's perceptions. Buddhism holds that all things are interconnected. Our lives are sustained by everything in the world, and because we are interconnected with all things, we also participate in the act of sustaining all the other things in the world. So we are given life and sustained at the same time we ourselves sustain other things. We are a drop in the ocean of existence. And like a single drop of water in the ocean, we, are, we may be a tiny individual drop, but at the same time, we are also one with the entire ocean of existence. Now, this oneness with all things is sometimes in Buddhism referred to as the great self. This is our oneness with the eternal original Buddha. If we can attain a tranquil samadhi when we recite the Dharanis and feel our oneness with all things, I think this is one way of experiencing the teaching. Now, throughout the world and in any society, there are many varieties of spirituality, of spiritual sensibilities. For example, some people may understand the religious practice in magical terms as a kind of mystical technology that, if performed correctly, can by itself have an automatic effect on the world. But the very same practice could be understood as the agency of a god or some higher power. And the very same practice could also be understood as a metaphor or a symbolic narrative that teaches us truth. And in that same religious practice 
could be explained from a modern materialist perspective. One could say that a practice has a beneficial effect um, on us and our being in the world, but that that effectiveness comes from the working of chemicals, molecules, brain waves, or possibly the results of how changes in our psychology impact our feelings and behavior. Many, if not most people, see these various modes of um, understanding or spirituality as mutually exclusive. And many people think of them as irreconcilable, but I don't think they are. I think it's my position that we can move between these various modes of spirituality as they meet our needs, because they're skillful needs. Each perspective can connect people with liberation from suffering. And if they do, then from the standpoint of the Lotus Sutra and Mahayana Buddhism, there are valid forms of skillful means. And as valid forms of skillful means, they are true. So I think because of this, we can join with other people and practice the same religious practices while allowing each other to have differing spiritual sensibilities and understandings of that practice. I think we can practice the Dharanis, for example, with many people who all have various different spiritualities and perspectives on the Dharanis. For this reason, the Dharanis are a practice that I think can unite people not by forcing the same spirituality on everyone, but by uniting people in their diversity and bringing people together from many spiritual, different spiritual sensibilities. There's a phrase that's often used in Buddhism, literally translated, it means different voices, same sound. People, each with their different and unique voices, can come together to make the same sound. I think practicing the Dharanis can be like this, bringing together people from many different nationalities, backgrounds, spiritual sensibilities, all to intone the same beautiful sound. Now with that, I'd like to conclude my talk, and uh, I thank you for listening, and now it's time for uh, me to listen to what you have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>